it's really great, a great honor to be here and to speak about this theme. You know, I, I've suddenly realized that I reached a point in my life where I'm mostly a lot of former things. And the difficulty with that is that you're also called in to speak on the basis of being former things. And there is always the risk that you then tend to speak about all the good things you did and all the crazy things they're doing now. Uh, on the other hand, as James just reminded, I was uh, representing uh, the EU presidency in, at the COP in Copenhagen. And that should rather bring you to the question, why did they invite this guy? So we can come back to that in the question, in the question uh, minutes after my, my, in, my introduction here. But first, I want you to um, uh, really look at this image because I think we can't remind ourselves enough often that we are really among the, or the, uh, we're among the privileged people in the first generations really with the ability of looking at our own planet in this way. It's so recently. I remember still as I was a child and there were the first pictures coming out from in this case this really amazing uh, event of seeing the earth rise uh, coming above the moon horizon. It's really, it's really a, a staggering view. And it really gives us the perspective that we belong to a common planet. Wherever we live, whatever life we live, we are on a common planet, on a common home. From that, I bring you through some thoughts about climate change. But we should in the end really come back to this perspective that everything also related to climate change negotiations is about this reality to really save and care our common home. And we are the first ones to really also through these photographs since some decades ago that are able to look at the planet from this perspective. So first of all, I would claim that as there was in, in the beginning, we all know that there was darkness, but in the beginning of climate change negotiations, there was science. And I think um, often people ask me, what, what's the main easy argument to understand really based on, on science um, that climate change is really happening and that we are in a complete different world now compared to earlier. And I used to say that um, the basic um, or the, the simplest way of understanding and showing people that it's the ice cores that we have uh, been able to dig down in the earth or in the ice rather back to 800,000 years. Soon, I think, we will be able to reach the ice cores from one million year back. And you can really study uh, the different layers of carbon emissions through the year, uh, the, the millennia. And this is just a graph used by NASA shows that for 650 years, uh, the atmospheric carbon dioxide had never been above this line that you see there in the middle. And there we are just far uh, above already now. Uh, and we're, you could say, just in the beginning of a change because of, of the current climate change going on. So I think it gives you just in one slide really captures the whole drama of what we are working at. The science about climate change, well, it started long ago, but we leave that part and just look at when it really had an impact on uh, politics and international negotiations. And it was when there was organized the first World Climate Conference, 1979, by the World Meteorological Organization. And then in a, in a row came many conferences where statements were made about the importance of really uh, making something about the climate change uh, 
challenge. A very serious problem affecting human survival was said 79, 88, uh, almost 10 years later, the Toronto Declaration, second only to a nuclear war, a global common concern of humanity, it was said, both in, in a Nordweek Declaration and, and in UNGA, that is the UN General Assembly, 1988. And the same year, 1988, uh, the WMO established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It means IPCC, as we usually call it, with the report, with the support of, of the UN um, Environmental Programme. And they published their first assessment report two years later. And the interesting thing is here, at this time, there were really few skeptics. So there was really this, you could say, dramatic language on one hand, came very quickly about, but also very few skeptics at this time. Then that changed with the first, you could say, more political initiative on international level because the UN General Assembly launched in the government a negotiating committee. They were to prepare the first piece on legislation, the, the Convention on Climate Change. Uh, and uh, it was then later on a framework convention, but it's the basis for all of the negotiations. And um, I think the, the interesting thing here is that this was the first time that fossil fuel industry really initiated some sort of lobbying activism. And uh, 1991 in Buenos Aires, the 13th World Petroleum Congress. So it was certainly not the first time the, the, the World Petroleum Congress met. It was the 13th time. Uh, they were visited by something what was called the Marshall Institute, a newly formed law, lobby organization in the USA. And they were invited with the specific aim of, of criticizing IPCC. And you could see that was a main pattern afterwards. For every new step in presenting uh, science, those lab lobbyists paid by the fossil industry came above and really tried to uh, dispute and uh, argue against the science behind policy. This is Bert Bolin. Uh, he was the first chairman of IPCC. So, and basically also, I think the main force behind forming the inter, uh, international or intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. And, and he played a tremendous role in the uh, first, during the first decade as he was the, the chairman of, of IPCC. And he, I, I read in his book about those years and he really mentioned how uh, important the initiatives were in, in counteracting science uh, by this fossil industry. You can read in different pages in different uh, parts of his book about new initiatives that come, came up. And basically what he's repeating again and again is things like, I was greatly troubled that key individuals in the industry, industry rejected careful analysis by scientists in the field using scientific arguments that could so easily be proven to be false, but that this, this might escape detection by the non-specialist. And he also goes on saying that he was astonished that fossil industry really accepted this loose scientific, uh, or, or rather this lack of scientific knowledge as the basis of their actions. But on the other hand, we have to say that it has been quite efficient, mostly in the United States, uh, where it was mostly really, where most of the activities took place, much less so already then in, in, in for example, Europe. So just to summarize, science initiated, I would say, every major step forward in the beginning of the international negotiations. Everything was originally initiated by science. 
Every major step forward in international negotiations was then followed by actions from the lobbying fossil fuel industry. And the main lobbying strategy was to attack and dispute the science behind the policy. So this is the first aspect I want, aspect I want to mention as really crucial for, for us as we try to understand what has been going on here. The second thing is really the, the north-south divide and the climate justice aspect. And this is now a, uh, an, an image from Rio 1992. It's the great UN conference on environment and development, exactly 20 years after the Stockholm conference, which was really the first one based on, on environment. But this was, you could say, the great moment of green diplomacy. Looking back, it's absolutely astonishing how much was achieved in, in those, well, months rather, uh, preparing and then uh, fulfilling the decisions at this Rio conference. And all, I mean, there were really so many heads of states and governments arriving. Also in those days, President Bush, uh, and mainly supporting the initiatives taken. And just to mention, first of all, of course, in our case, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's really the basis for climate change negotiations and also for uh, the Paris Agreement. Then you had the Rio Declaration on the Environment and Development. You had the Biodiversity Convention. You had the Rio Forest Declaration. Expect, well, where, where there were expectations for a forest convention, but that never happened. So it was rather a declaration. The Agenda 21, uh, and then also two years later, based on the decisions in Rio, the convention to combat desertification. So a great moment, great success, you could say, from an, envir an environmental or ecological point of view. But there were also really, that was really the start of realizing the great difficulties to overcome uh, the split in views on justice issues related to these aspects. And the basic principle formulated in the, con the Climate Change Convention, the, the so-called UNFCCC. There are so many acronyms in, in international negotiations, and that's just a way of seeming professional, but uh, it's basically uh, extraordinary confusional, but no, confusing. But still, uh, this convention says in one of the uh, um, well, founding uh, Articles that the parties should protect the climate system in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And as I became minister many years later, uh, this was one of the first experiences I had, that this was one of the most repeated sentences wherever you came and wherever you discussed, because people tended really to mean very different things with this uh, sentence. And I guess that's maybe one of the, uh, the, the well, genial things with making uh, international agreements, that you have some wording where all can stand behind, but you mean sometimes very different things by it. But this was usually interpreted, and step by step more and more so, as applying for two different groups of countries, developing and developed countries. And then based on that, binding commitments were defined for developed countries, while there were no similar commitments for uh, developing countries. And I think in those days, that was absolutely reasonable. Uh, just a very small share of emissions in those days came from uh, developing countries. And the world was then divided into two blocks, developed and developing countries, based on, and that was the part of the problem, an ad hoc distinction without any clear uh, and explicit criteria. Now, some years later, the Kyoto Protocol was, was agreed based on a reality very different from today. And here you see a much slimmer version of Al Gore compared to today. And together with him, some of the representatives of, of Japan. 
the host country for Kyoto Protocol negotiations. And this is not just a symbol for a first agreement based on the convention, but rather also the way how the model for negotiating was developed. Because basically, the Kyoto Protocol was built upon this principle on two groups of countries, one group developed countries with precise commitments. It was this idea that the world is quite rational. You put a target, an objective target for, for all the world. You distribute that the richer countries. They reduce their emissions. Everything will work fine. And then developing countries will have more of, of space in atmosphere to, to have their legitimate part of emissions in, into the atmosphere. Now, sadly, the world isn't very rational, and it doesn't function in a rational way. And it, the reality as such also changed, and that's what you see here. So in the top there, you see 1990, and the darker or the reddish part to the left, that's developed countries, 1990. Developed countries emissions, 1990. To the right, you have the blue slice there, quite small in those days, representing 31% of emissions. Uh, but now, looking at the bottom there, you have uh, emissions 2012 compared to 1990. And there you can see that actually developed countries' emissions have, uh, in, in absolute terms, started to be reduced. But instead, you have had the great uh, expansion of emissions from developing countries. And here you can see part of the problem with of working with these two just categories. Because it's very unfair for, for to count, I mean, countries, the, the least developed countries, many places in Africa, in some places of Asia, where you have also the, the um, small island developing states, they're part of this group. And they, of course, emit almost nothing. They're just affected by all the emissions. But on the other hand, you have countries, especially like China, which represent most of this enormous expansion of uh, emissions. But partly also India, not comparable to, to China, that has to be said. They're often mentioned in the same sentence, but it, it's really different dimensions. So, so uh, but also Mexico, Brazil, uh, South Africa, Indonesia, uh, some oil producing countries, they are, are also important if you look at the emissions. But basically it's about China. And just to show slides with pictures, on one hand you have uh, African states, which, I mean, they belong to the group of developed, developing countries, but they have a very, very different situation compared to uh, these, um, oh sorry, these ones, uh, gathered in different groups within developing countries. It's China here, it's Brazil, it's India, South Africa. They created a certain group just two weeks before the Copenhagen meeting, called themselves BASIC, based on their acronyms of, of the countries, um, Brazil, South Africa, India, China, but it was under the leadership, based on an initiative on chi from China and under the leadership of, of, of China. And um, well, here to the left you have Che Chenhua. He was the Minister for Climate Change, a very interesting person. I worked a lot with him. Uh, we could discuss a lot about him, but a very, very nice and constructive person. Um, but I also met him in occasions where he, were, he was just under the control of, of the foreign ministry and that changed many things in those occasions. Here you have Dilma Rousseff, she later became the president of, of Brazil. In those days, as I worked with them, uh, she represented, uh, she was uh, head of staff of, of President Lula in those days. Yairam Ramesh, a very, uh, he, he, he was extraordinary, I would say, among the Indian ministers. Uh, I met several of them, and, and he was really a, a great negotiator, tough, smart, but also very constructive. 
And finally, also the South African minister, uh, Buelba Sonjika. There's a loss of A there. But it's just to say, they were all uh, more or less very constructive, but they all also represented interests where they had really to make sure that they used the, 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 this uh, construction of two groups as a way of, in a sense you could say, hide away from the, the commitments or the, 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 the responsibility they should take, especially China, uh, with so large portion of world's emission. Uh, and on the other hand, based on the differences with the other uh, developing countries. Here, it's a discussion with, with uh, the African ministers, as I said. Here are we three EU representatives. You see a quite blonde guy there, it's me, and you have some of the others. Otherwise, it's just ministers from Africa. And this is one of just many occasions, I would say, when EU was in very close dialogue with Africa. But in the end, that was just you could say, in a sense, uh, never, it never really was impactful uh, preparing, for example, Copenhagen. So just to, to summarize here, the gaps of injustices, I would say, are much bigger than politicians in the wealthiest countries uh, usually wants to admit. And much bigger resources have to be redistributed from rich to poor. A bigger economic transformation has to be achieved. If, if anything, in the resemblance of justice should be reached. But I would also claim that justice cannot be, be reached based on the principle of two groups of countries developed and developing. It's too simplified in, in the negotiations, in the context of negotiations. So uh, thirdly then, ex the experience of, I would call it a collapse in, in Copenhagen, and, and a near-death experience. From that, a turn into new life. Here is Connie Hedegaard. She was the president of that COP meeting in Copenhagen. And I think she represented an example of EU's strategy in those days. She was the first climate minister. And she launched, you could say, a political campaign with the aim of, as she said, to raise the political price of not acting to a level at which no one is prepared to pay it. It meant that everyone should be pushed, really, through great expectations to act before and at Copenhagen. And first, it seemed to be a great um, strategy. All of EU was behind that. I was very active as I represented the, the EU presidency in those days to, to come up with these claims. Now I would say it was a great mistake. We'll come back to that. But it led us to different places like the White House where we met with, with um, Obama. And that was, of course, I mean, this is a slide you put in, in there to give the impression that I was very important. It, it was, <laughs> of course, just a courtesy visit at the White, White House with us main negotiators in those days, uh, representing the, the most involved countries, like 30 ministers or something. Uh, but I think it was also a sign of uh, the... the, the, the intention of Obama to show his interest and commitment to the issue. And in, the, to, in that sense, quite different, you could say, in some sense from today. And then the conference came. And um, Connie Hedegaard was not the president anymore, suddenly in the last days. They, they really instead installed the prime minister, suddenly created many questions. And um, there is, for, for the one who is interested, an in really exciting behind the scene description of, of that conference. Sadly, a book written in Danish, so it's not that <laughs> easy to read. But there is a short summary of it called The Runaway Summit, uh, written by per, per Mailstrup. And he's a journalist, a Danish journalist, and he has really many insights from the preparation, the view of the Danish presidency. And he just summarized that the largest gathering of ever of heads and states outside the UN headquarters, it was the Copenhagen 
uh, meeting, 122, had declared that they would take part in the COP. So that in itself was a great success. Prime ministers and presidents don't usually attend meetings that risk failing. And I think that is a good sentence just to describe in those days. Everyone thought that this would be a great success. We would come out with really the great agreement. In the end, as you all know, that didn't happen at all. So instead, uh, there was a huge uh, confusion. And as Obama arrived the last day, he was welcomed by Hillary Clinton, who said, Mr. President, this is the worst meeting I've been to since the eighth grade student council. <laughs> Uh, also quite a good or quite a nice summary of the confusion there. Basically, I would say uh, negotiations didn't happen. I, I spent so many hours just waiting for, for the delegation from China, India and others to come. They never turned up. And, and uh, there was really just days where you achieved absolutely nothing. But the background was also Obama's failing in the Senate. I mean, the legislation he came up with very boldly failed in the Senate. Uh, there you had the financial crisis and economy that was the dominating issue. It's about economy now. Everyone is bothered about the financial crisis. This was 2008, 2009. Then um, the, the meeting happened, and this was um, chosen as uh, the, the, the photo of the, of the year in Sweden. The photograph was let into the room where it seems uh, Obama talks with several, what it looked here, world leaders. So it was, it was called the world order of power stripped during moment gathered in just one room. Well, it's a very nice idea that this should be the, the, the most powerful in the world gathered in just one room and how they are stripped, power stripped, you could say, or the powerlessness of the powerful. The story behind, though, is that this wasn't the room where the agreement was made. Here are the European leaders. And Obama basically came to say, I've just made an agreement with some other people. Uh, and by the way, there is a, an, a storm coming in over the Atlantic. I have to leave with, with the aeroplane just in a minute. After that, he went out and had a press conference with just the American uh, journalists. It wasn't um, sent immediately on television. It turned up on television screens some hours later that evening. And the meeting he talked about was a meeting basically with China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, the basic group. And they were sitting somewhere, Obama didn't know where, but he went out to find the room and, and behind glass doors, he found them, he just went in together with Hillary Clinton. And there they sat uh, discussing with these men and they achieved in the late moments or in the last moments, you could say, some key uh, aspects of an agreement. And um, that what came out was later called the Copenhagen Accord. It was nothing compared with the expectations. I mean, we had expected a full-fledged agreement on climate change. Instead, it was just like two and a half pages about, about um, the issue. It was basically, this is a Swedish proverb, you just translated into English. The mountain gave birth to a mouse. And it was basically a new model, a pledge and review model, which you as always had supported. It means you put on the table what you want to uh, put there. And then you build an agreement on this bottom-up approach. And bottom-up always sounds very nice, but Basically here it meant you put on the table what you want to put on the table and you decide by yourself nationally. So each country puts on the table what they decide, they themselves decide to achieve no legally binding aspects of it, no, or basically not, no targets, no timetables, but a list of commitments and actions. And that really basically meant leaving, you could say, the Kyoto model behind. Now, that's the new birth on the same time.
you could say. So this is the birth of new life, but out came a new model. Uh, and, and this is the celebration of that new, mo new model. That's the Paris, not one year later, that's uh, wrong. It's, it's um, six years later. It, it, this slide has been used in another context. They're all very happy here. Um, of course, Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, it's the Executive Director of, of Climate Change Negotiations, it's the French uh, Foreign Minister and also the French uh, President in those days. And, um, well, I think everyone was happy that had been involved. And it's just interesting to understand some of the logic behind. And, and first of all, you could say that it's often not seen, but in some cases, US and China has a very common interest. And that relates to their role as, as great powers. Uh, I mean, no or rather superpowers, because no one of these two superpowers want to be constrained by legally binding commitments. And that was the key of the confrontation that you had there. China would, of course, like it for US. And US could accept it if China would undertake it. But both, so both understand the, the other superpower, uh, uh, well, that they, they both understand that the other superpower wouldn't accept it without the, them participating. So the pragmatic solution is, you could say, based on realism and weaker legal form. And that's exactly what came out of, of Paris. It's still a legal. It's still a legal aspect of it. It's still legally binding in many senses, in senses. But it's not legally. It's not internationally legally binding commitments regarding your emission reductions. It's rather based on this principle: common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in light of different national circumstances. It means really you leave the idea of just working on the basis of two groups, but it's also more uh, <coughs> differentiated based on your national circumstances. It's in theory, that would make a huge difference for African countries on one hand, for example, or China on the other hand. For China, this doesn't change their request for a differentiation into two groups. So they still work on that premises because that helps them to keep some of the privileged privilege they would have as being counted as a developing country. And, and that certainly goes for one of the most important uh, aspects of, of this new uh, logic, you could say. I'll come to that in a moment. Because here you moved, you could say, from a, a, a logic of targets where you had this division into two groups, developed and developing, you had legally binding targets, and you had fixed targets with timetables. After that came, you could say, a logic of, or now we're rather in a logic of pathways. It's pledge and review. If you put on the table what do we want, countries submit decarbonization pathways. It's regular reporting, which is extremely important, and it's also regular review of ambition level. With the, aim, with, the, with the aim that you always just upgrade your ambition level. You're not allowed to, uh, to reduce your ambition level. A test case is, of course, now what will happen in the United States. So you could just simplify by saying Kyoto was a pre-ordered fixed menu, but after Copenhagen, it's rather a potluck. You bring what you want to the table. Uh, so then, of course, comes the question, how could we create trust in such a system? Well, in, if in the Kyoto target system, it was the legally binding nature that was meant to create legally binding uh, a, a trust. In the, future, it's rather path, in the future pathway system, it's rather transparency. You show your ambition level, you show what you're doing, you, repeat, you report, and your report should be reviewed, and it should really be measured whether you're in, in line with, with your stated ambition level. And here is just to mention that an interesting aspect of, of again, the, the Chinese strategy, because I think they, it's the idea that they want all regulation about transparency to be linked to this two-group uh, aspect again. 
So yes, even if they have undertaken their own, um, presented their own national plan for em reducing emissions, and it's quite, quite ambitious, they don't want to apply to the same transparency as, for example, the United States or other uh, developed countries. So, finally, uh, in those days, there is a lot of discussion on whether the, the Paris Agreement would be challenged by Trump, or I would add, China, question mark. This is, in those days, a, a, a man many loves to, to hate. And he's often mentioned because of the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And, and of course, rightly so. Uh, and, it's all, and as he recently said, I think in October, the Paris Climate Accord is simply the latest example of Washington entering into an agreement that disadvantaged the uh, this advantages is the United States to the exclusive benefit of other countries. I mean, if you understand the first slide I showed you with the globe, you really understand how out of reality this just national perspective would be. And it's rather pitching a domestic perspective with them, Washington, against us, other Americans. The rest of the world is not even there, you could say, just as an enemy. Um, but on the other hand, there is a lot of speculation on whether maybe China then would come up in a leadership position. And you could say that the Chinese leadership is much more skilled in, in formulating la a language that implies to be more uh, ambitious. And recently again in October, at the opening of the Communist Party Congress, the, the President Xi declared that China had taken a driving seat in international cooperation to respond to climate change. He also criticized countries that retreat into self-isolation. And again, rightly so. And you could also easily understand which he was, um, what country he was pointing at, even if he didn't mention any name. So maybe this was really many analysts asked a, a dramatic move forward in taking the leadership. I think still one has to put a great question mark behind that. It doesn't seem too likely. If you, if you look at the main strategy that, that Xi Jinping has so far followed, it's mostly the, the announcement that China must adapt to what he called from the beginning a new normal of slower but better quality economic growth. And that seems very reasonable. Um, and they still have, you could say, enormous growth numbers compared to most countries in the world. Uh, and, and Nicholas Stone, the famous economist that really made some of the key uh, calculation on, on costs for non-action on climate change, uh, together with another re uh, economic researcher, Fergus Green, they have estimated that this new model of lower growth could, could see China's carbon emissions peaking as early as 2025, which is five years earlier than pr promised in, in Paris. And, and the question is, will that really happen? And again here, it's all a, a great question mark. But we should be aware that, um, well, the question is really, is this a new normal, as he said? Or is it just a, a will we just experience a fallback on depth fueled support to maintain high carbon sectors? Look at the steel industry, for example, which is a key industry for emissions. And, and it has estimated an overcapacity of over around one third of the total production capacity in China. So you can see that it's an enormous. Uh, overcapacity for steel production. They really either they just have to, to kill a lot of industry, thereby a lot of job, create a great social turmoil, or they have to create and find ways to really export more steel. And then as that demand doesn't exist there, they have to find a way to really push for that demand. 
And uh, you could just guess that, I mean, if you would assume that other heavy manufacturing sectors are similarly afflicted, this, was be, uh, this would be like tenth, a tenth of, of Chinese GDP. That has, of course, enormous effects on job and social reality for people. And, and then the key here is really that the leadership is looking beyond its border for new generators of future growth. And two years ago, 2015, government released the action plan for a grand strategy to generate new growth and boost China's influence. One belt, one road. And this, this is the idea that you, you export uh, concrete, you export um, steel, you export um, electric power stations, you invest heavily, and you create these uh, relations of not just trade, but basically also dependence with many of the other uh, developing uh, countries in, involved, especially in Africa. And um, you use that as a way of achieving another uh, economic growth period. Here is, on one hand, the image of China's enormous coal consumption. Uh, and I mean, China, even if it's ahead of its Paris target, consumes much more coal than the rest of the world combined. That's one picture, which is often mentioned. The other picture, though, is also the green technologies developed within China. And if you count the numbers on wind energy, on solar investments, it's bigger than in any other part of the world as well. So it's really astonishing what happens now on the, on the green markets for, for China. So, of course, the key question here is whether this growth will be brown or green, to simplify the story. And, and the thing is that this one belt, one road aims, as I said, creating corridors and trade routes complete with infrastructures, roads, railways, ports, pipelines, and power stations, and then linking China to Russia, Europe, East Africa, uh, via Pakistan, and Central and Western Asia. And, and uh, even if they have this leading expertise and capacity in green infrastructure, infrastructure you, it still has to be shown whether that is the way or, or the, the parts of production that will be uh, powered or, or supported by this initiative. On the other hand, and that's a key rationale for the One Belt, One Road, is to provide an outlet for overcapacity from India's already uh, emission-dependent industry. And I th that's why, why I fear it's more likely to be brown than green. We don't know yet, but I think we should be cautious to know that this would be then really binding countries, developing countries, to long-term fossil fuel dependency if it happens, and it could also create really strong uh, economic, not just link, but dependency on China. So just to summarize, science has been the driving force behind the negotiating process. The north-south divide and climate injustices has created division into two different groups of countries that does not really reflect the real differences. The Copenhagen collapse imitated a, or initiated a new model for an agreement very different from Kyoto. And the Paris Agreement represents a move from a logic of targets to a logic of pathways where trust is built through transparency instead of legally binding targets. And we still don't know whether the Paris Agreement will be seriously challenged by US or by both China and US. Uh, or, or, well, so really we don't know yet what will come out here, but we know that these, these will be decisive. So where are we heading after the Paris Agreement? Obviously, first of all, the world is lacking behind. I mean, these shows the UNEP emissions gap report. It shows that in the top there you have the baseline where you see that's where the current trends are. Far beyond where we should be if we should reach anything similar to the two degree target or even more so the 1.5 range. There in the middle you have the what is called now the the NDCs, again, those acronyms, but it's actually the national plans for emissions presented by almost all countries in the world, which is a great success in itself, but still not far enough at all to reach either the two 
uh, degree range, which you see there, bowing downwards, or the one, in even less so, of course, the 1.5 range. So it seems difficult, and there, this is a recent, this is a recent report published by really distinguished, really worldwide um, acknowledged uh, scientists, Ramanathan and, and Chu, and they, I just picked this because of the language they use, because in their scenarios here, they show us how close we are to move into dangerous, but they use also the word catastrophic areas, and in the end they use this existential, which is really a very, very strong word if you put it into a scientific report, and they describe that as sort of un unknown territories for uh, the effect on, uh, effects on climate. So, I mean, based on these aspects, you could be very pessimistic. That's why, as I prepared a paper, a little paper for this conference, I, I said it's important really to search for hidden opportunities. And I use this term that uh, Aristotle elaborated on, the term entelechy. To him, it referred to the complete realization of inherent potential, the conditions under which a potential becomes actualized. And in, in his mind, it also a society could also be said to embody entelechy, which makes it interesting in this context. It's, it's a concept that refers to searching for hidden opportunities in a situation, in a society, and even in a serious crisis. And in my paper, I mentioned institutional reform as one aspect of that, um, ethics as another aspect of that, and I could also mention culture. I won't go into all of that now, but just mention in the end that, um, first of all, even if you sometimes become depressed by the slow pace by international negotiations on climate change, first of all, you should remember it's been much quicker compared to World Trade Organization and the World Trade Negotiations. Uh, I mean, this took like 25 years. In the, that case, the main agreements took 50 years to achieve. And these are the two most complex, most difficult negotiations on, international, uh, on the international arena. But even more important in this context is maybe just to see that that covers the, the upper left part here, the UN legal regimes. But you have so many other aspects of the international society or community working on expert assessments, specialized UN agencies, bilateral initiatives, clubs, multilateral development banks, unilateral action, Montreal Protocol. You have the market, no, financial market regulation. You have uh, trade agreements. You have different aspects of the international community, both formally within you and, and in clubs and in other, in other constellations. So it's much more going on. That's one important aspect to remember, even if I was asked to talk about climate change negotiations, uh, not climate change negotiations. And the other one, and that's where I will finalize, we know this aspect of, of the tragedy of the commons, where it's thought that uh, it, it's the description of where a situation where individuals put benefit by putting in this example, the usual ones, they sheep onto the common pasture, but everyone pays the long-term cost. So you let your, your sheep into that common area, they eat the grass, uh, they eat of the grass, and um, step by step they just... Um, well, destroy the area, but you still, in a short run, profit from that, and that's why you let them go there. So the question is, is that, first of all, true? And, it, oh, sorry, is it also now that we're really experiencing here the tragedy of the commons? Individual countries really profiting from overusing the globe while we all, in the long run, will, will pay the, the long-term cost. The great idea, behind uh, Eleanor Ostrom's science uh, is that this tragedy of the commons can be avoided. She was uh, a Nobel laureate 2009, she came in Stockholm, 
and, and uh, it was during my term as, as minister, so it was great to see her there. And uh, the, she said that, well, the commons can be managed from the bottom up for a shared prosperity, given the right institutions. And she said, if the herders decide to cooperate with one another, monitoring each other's use of the land, like transparency, and enforcing rules for managing it, they can avoid the tragedy. And that the, is the principle of common stewardship. She died in cancer three, three years later. But just the last months she, before she died, she, she also published this article where she said that we cannot rely on singular global policies to solve the problem of managing our common resources. The oceans, atmosphere, forest, waterways, and rich diversity of life that combine to create the right conditions for life, including seven billion humans to thrive. We have never had to deal with problems like of the scale facing today's globally interconnected society. No one knows for sure what will work. So it is important to build a system that can evolve and adapt rapidly. Inaction would be disastrous, but a single international agreement as the only solution would be a grave mistake. The goal now must be to build sustainability into the DNA of our globally interconnected society. And then she came to the conclusion, decades of research demonstrate that a variety of overlapping policies at city, subnational, national and international level is, levels is more likely to succeed than our single overarching binding agreements. Evolutionary policy making provides essential safety nets should one or more policies fail. A heterogeneous collection of cities are interacting, could have far-reaching influence on Earth's entire life support system, learning from one another, building on good ideas, and yet zoning poorer ones. I think this is a very this is a great way of summarizing a way forward and also to discover hidden possibilities. And I think thereby also we could show on a global level that the, the, the tragedy of the commons could be avoided. And to go back to the, the image of the globe and the experience of this astronaut, Russell Rusty Schweikart at the Apollo 9 in the 60s. He often, he, he came back to that story uh, many years later at a speech he delivered where he said, he described he, his experience then in those days, just, you know, traveling in, in the atmosphere around the planet Earth. And where he said, now he, it means himself, sees the Earth as a small thing out there. It is so small and so fragile and such a precious little spot in the universe that you can block it out with your thumb. And you realize that on that small spot, that little blue and white thing is everything that means anything to you. All love, tears, joy, games, all of it on that little spot out there that you can cover with your thumb. And you realize from that perspective that you've changed, that there's something new there, that the relationship is no longer what it was. And I think that's a beautiful description of the new relationship between humans and all of the Earth that has to be achieved uh, in the coming years. And it could be possible, even if there are many stumbling blocks, and we shouldn't be naive, but work on, on real also hope, which is very different from optimism. Thank you very much. Thank you.